Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. News and views with an Asian and Asian American point of view. Tonight, we head back to school and look at some amazing programs preparing young people to continue the fight for justice. First, we hear from high school teachers Rochelle Urzua and Jody Di Arajo. They work with Wilderness Arts and Literacy Collaborative, a small learning community that teaches high school curriculum through a lens of environmental stewardship. Then we speak with Sammy Ablaza Wills from API Equality Northern California, an API LGBTQ organization in San Francisco, training and building a youth led movement. And we'll hear from Maida Asana with Act for CUSD, who are working to make sure public schools in the South Bay have comprehensive sex education that covers important things like consent and uses inclusive language around gender expression and sexual orientations. We're your hosts, Nono Girl and Eunice. Stay with us. <laughs> First, we have a commentary from Melissa Hung, a native of Houston, Texas, about her hometown. Houston, a love letter. I write this from California, 1,900 miles away from my hometown, as I watch the devastation of Hurricane Harvey unfold. On the news and in my social media feeds, the raging rain and rising floodwaters overtake the streets I know. On day two, I catch my friend on her cell phone, five seconds after she's emerged from her closet. She was huddled there with her spouse and cats, heeding a tornado warning. On day three, my parents report that they have lost power, but remain dry. My sister shares a photo of my aunt's street. The water has risen to the bottom edge of a stop sign, and my aunt has taken shelter at a neighbor's house. On day four, my dad texts, water coming from the bayou now, filling up the streets. Please pray for us. I am not religious, but I pray. I am a daughter of Houston, born in its downtown, raised in its humid heat. I grew up in its public schools and grew strong on its Tex-Mex. And though I've lived in California now for more than 15 years, Houston is still home. How powerfully the calling for home tugs when disaster strikes. Houston made me who I am, a straight shooting, no-nonsense, Mexican food-loving, Tex-Asian-American writer. And now, as it struggles, I think of my love for the city and the ways it shaped me. I love you, Houston, for your independent, quirky, creative spirit. Long before the saying, you do you, was popular, Houstonians have been doing themselves. I love that there are enough people creating outrageous sculptures out of their cars that we hold an annual art car parade. I love that an artist bought a decommissioned church, pews and all, to live in and started a cinema in it. I love the fact that a man decided to cover his home in flattened beer cans and that his neighbors helped him drink the beer. I love that the flower man scavenged for detritus abandoned in the streets, carting his hall home on his bike, painting it over in bright colors and affixing it all to his house. Christmas lights, broken toys, rocking horses, mirrors, pieces of wood, and mangy stuffed animals were arranged and rearranged all over his house, a lifelong, always in progress, art assemblage. I love that you could stop by, and if he were home, he'd come out and talk to you only in Houston. I love you, Houston, for your immigrant hustle, how you are the landing spot for refugees from around the world. I love how 145 languages are spoken in your homes. I love that in my diverse high school, this Chinese American girl from the West Side became best friends with a Chicana from the North Side. I love how all these communities mean that we have the best food. I love the weekend dim sum carts rolling up and down the rows of your noisy Chinese banquet halls. I love your breakfast tacos served through drive-through windows. 
I love your late night Vietnamese joints, your Nigerian hole in the walls, and your vegetarian Indian buffets. I love you, Houston, for your language as colorful as its people, the metaphors and similes peppered in everyday speech. She's all hat and no cattle. He's a few sandwiches short of a picnic. The time my colleague told my other colleague that her dress looked like a curtain in a whorehouse. I love how we're always fixing to do this and fixing to do that, an announcement of intentions. I love the way people speak directly, and even when they don't, how a certain way of saying, well, bless his heart, is the nicest sounding insult I've ever heard. I love you, Houston, for your casual politeness and laid back friendliness. I love the way when you let someone into your lane on the road, you get a little thank you wave in return. People don't do that in other places, and it's a shame. I love you, Houston, for your massive sprawl, how there's always more Houston to explore. Though I'm always dispelling people's mistaken notions of what Texas is like, one thing is true. Everything really is bigger in Texas. And I miss driving your crisscrossing ribbon of freeways and their accompanying feeder roads. It might seem wrong to love a freeway with six lanes of traffic in each direction. A freeway that's even 26 lanes across in one section. But late at night, when traffic's light, I can glide clear across town. I love the big sky and the sense of big possibility it instilled in me, even when I was very small. Even though, compared to you, I will always be small. And I love you, Houston, for how, in this time of enormous need, ordinary people respond with unwavering kindness. How a flotilla of private citizens with boats launched its own rescue missions of neighborhoods and strangers. How people walk to work if they can because it's the right thing to do. How a pastor checked submerged cars to make sure no one was trapped in them. How many have opened their doors a shelter, whether it be neighbors or churches or mosques or the furniture showrooms and mattress smack known to every Houstonian for his energetic insistence that he'll save you money in his TV commercials. How volunteers show up to work the shelters. How a group of bakers stranded in a bakery kept working, making sheet after sheet of pen dolce to give to those in need. How a brother of a high school friend I haven't spoken to in years drove over in his white Tahoe, waded through the waters, and knocked on my parents' door to move them to higher ground. I love you, Houston, for taking care of them and for taking care of one another. As your body grows big, the mind must flower. It's great to learn, because knowledge is power. It's Schoolhouse Rocket, the ship on the block of your favorite schoolhouse. Now a segment produced by Lindsay Oda, who's with us in the studio today. Wilderness Arts and Literacy Collaborative, or WALK, is a program at Balboa High School and Downtown High School in San Francisco. Teachers started WALK 17 years ago to reform high school education through environmental and ethnic studies. They also hoped their off-site camping trips would mitigate ethnic rivalries among students. Here in the studio, we have astronomy and environmental science teacher Jode De Araujo from Balboa High School, Amanda Mobo, incoming UC Davis student and graduated WALK student from Balboa High School, and humanities and math teacher, teacher Rochelle Urzua from Downtown High School. Rochelle and Jody, could you give a brief history of WALK and how it started 17 years ago? Yeah, um, so WALK was started at actually as a club at Balboa High School by Conrad Benedicto and Kenneth Gonzalez. And they started it as an outdoor club to try and mitigate some of the issues that were happening on campus. There was some racial tension at the time. And so they started an after school club called Unity Club and that slowly morphed into what Walk is. And at downtown high school, Conrad's wife, Catherine Selvin, was um, a teacher there. And the school was moving into a project-based school. And so she saw that, that, that club as an opportunity for an actual project. And so she was the first teacher to teach curriculum with WALK. And so um, it's just grown from there. And now, you know, here we are this long later with so many graduated classes and a lot of curriculum under our belts now. So what I'm hearing is that you guys are teaching regular high school subjects, but then there's this theme of environmentalism involved. Um, 
Amanda, what about this interested you and uh, spurred you to join Walk? Um, well, what I learned before um, signing up to be into Walk, I knew that there was a lot of writing involved and there was field trips involved and both were things that I was really interested in. And so I decided to sign up for it. Awesome. So Rochelle and Jody, is it a hard sell then to get students to join WALK? Or are they naturally interested like Amanda? I understand that students at uh, Balboa High School and Downtown High School, they're urban, they're students of color. Um, usually environmentalism and outdoor activities are seen as having white audiences. Mm -hmm. So how um, is it getting students into these classes and programs? Yeah, I mean, I would say that for the most part, I find that students are similar to Amanda in that, you know, it's actually is hard for them to stay in the same classroom for the entire day. And so the opportunity to be outside and learn um, is actually something that excites them. Of course, I think there are times when it can be uncomfortable to try something new. Um, and, you know, I just have new a new class who was telling me they're like wait we're not going to shower for four days on our first trip and I, and I had to break that news for that to them that yeah we're not going to shower but ultimately the response is always that they are most excited about these trips and after they've gone on one they're pretty hooked so when you're out on these trips uh you guys have these teachers of color like yourself and these students of color um what is the reactions to seeing your group um, out in these camps and parks? Yeah, uh, so we oftentimes are looked at as the group who's responsible for kind of anything that goes wrong, and so that's just the reality of it. Um, anytime there's anything that's left out or any rule has been broken or there's a noise violation, we're for sure the first camp that comes and gets checked on by a ranger. And we actually are, we have so many rules that that's never us, um, but we are prepared all the time to always be blamed for anything going wrong in a campsite, on a trail, um, anything. And we also have people just stop and ask us like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, where is your teacher? What do you mean? And so like, we're always kind of seen with a suspicious eye. And that's something we actually even have to prepare our students for um, and let them know and explain to them how environmentalism has become this white world and how we are taking it back and using it as a, a system to break down the systems of oppression that have been um, historically and currently affecting them in their day-to-day -day lives. And so we use environmentalism as a, as a thread for that. And we teach them that and how to empower themselves in those spaces and to feel welcome and to take back those spaces. Hmm. So sense of place was one of those themes that I had heard that you guys teach uh, during a semester. Amanda, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, what you learned and what that was like for you. Um sense of place was the theme in my junior year my first year in walk and for me i feel like i developed my sense of place definitely on the first walk trip that i was on because i i developed like a sense of place in my in the classroom and with all the people that i was with already and so being out camping and stuff like we just bonded a lot more and learning about the geography and like how certain like Lake Tahoe was our first trip and we learned about how that whole landscape was formed and I think that's what really developed my sense of place. So from that semester I heard that you wrote a poem reflecting on that trip that you went on. Would you be able to read that for us? Um, this is my poem. It's called Now Playing. Boats honk and wood chippers fog the joyful song. With the hum of air breezing through trees, the sweet melody of wind, the swishes of the rhythm of the lake. And now, shredded trees moan in grief. Wind screams in anger at the destruction. The lake overflows with tears. A song of sorrow drowns out the once happy song. You see, the beauty of our world may not always remain. So what will we do to make a change? 
Thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, uh, I want to ask, um, later on in this program, you guys do a legacy project, and uh, it seems to be putting in action your, what you've learned. So, Amanda, what did you do for your legacy project? So uh, I was assigned, or I was, I got to choose who my group mates were, and we got to decide together what we thought would be, um, like a change we would want to see at Bal in terms of its environmental impact, and so we decided to tackle. Um, energy usage and so we created a presentation on how much fossil fuels we use how mu how dependent we are on fossil fuels and basically we presented our pr presentation to several classrooms like underclassmen and it was essentially like a campaign to minimize light usage at our school um Jody and Rochelle, can you talk about uh, what is the most rewarding part of seeing students be able to uh, do these legacy projects and put to work um, everything that you've taught over the previous semesters? Um, I'd say for me at downtown high school, because of the population we serve, we're a continuation high school. So we serve students from the poorest and most oppressed neighborhoods in San Francisco. Um, the most gratifying and moments that make me the proudest are watching my students realize their own potential because their experience in education has been negative up until the point often that they come to us. And so watching my students see how smart they are and see how brilliant they are and to take ownership of these beautiful places that we take them is one of the most meaningful and gratifying parts of doing the work that we do. Yeah, I think similar to what Rochelle and Amanda were saying about sense of place, even for me, um, I feel like even as a as a woman of color um, who grew up in San Francisco, that um, environmental spaces were not always open for me or thought of as the place where we, I could serve. And to see students recognize um, their connection to these spaces and then feel a responsibility towards them and towards educating other people about them um, is just something that really lights me up. And um, yeah. Uh, going back a little bit to the structure of this program and how it was first created to soften ethnic rivalries within school. Can you talk about how WALK specifically does that? Um, I would say it does it in a, because we are taking students into different environments than they're used to, where there was already this pent up tension. Um, school, a traditional school model is really not that conducive to a lot of our students. And so taking them somewhere else into a basically a neutral zone and then teaching them and explaining to them that a lot of the systems that they fight amongst with themselves are actually put upon them by the outside forces, right? Like these systems of oppression. And so when we teach them about their own histories and we teach them about education through the lens of their own histories, they can see the commonalities that they have and actually see that, you know, we shouldn't be fighting each other as opposed to fighting these systems that have been historically and continually pushed upon them that actually creates division. And so we try and use that as a unifier. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and um, looking towards the future for these students post-graduation, like Amanda, um, they are stepping maybe back into these worlds where um, their communities experience an advancement of profit over public good. So whether that looks like deportation, gentrification, or chemical dumping in Bayview, um, and then on a global scale, uh, people of color are experiencing the worst effects of climate change. And um, thinking of typhoons in the Philippines, flooding in India, uh, how are students more prepared for these realities? And that's even a question for yourself, Amanda. Um, and um, what has WAC given them um, to prepare themselves for this? Yeah, so I think... When, when I think about how my students make impact and become the activists that I hope they be, um, it really starts with 
as Rochelle was saying, identifying the systems that are in place and that have influenced them. And so um, one of the big projects at Balboa in their senior year is that students work on a self-analysis paper. And this is um, a paper where it's a really honest and brave self-discovery where students have to identify all the factors that have influenced them. Um, and I have heard of so many students who talk about how, you know, even in their home life, um, there have been like standards, um, gender roles that have been placed on them and how, you know, just as part of activism is really just identifying those forces to be able to then make informed decisions for the future. Um, and so I think that's one way that we prepare them is just having them open up this level of awareness and then um, empowering them to feel like, okay, now we can make more informed decisions about our future. Um, yeah, to add to that, too, I think a lot of our students, I mean, the city is such a condensed place, so I think a lot of them don't even necessarily see the the bigger global picture. And so when we teach them about these cultures that sometimes they're identified with or that they're detached from because they've been, you know, they're, they're city kids, um, they see how the impacts of the things that we do even affect people from other countries. They see how, yes, those those faces are usually brown, the people that are affected, and like they can feel identity with those people, even though they're, they're such a huge divide between them culturally, they could see how they can have an impact on like something global. So it's like beyond just yourself and having power in the world. And I think that's a, a way we try and prepare them just so even that they inform themselves of things that are just beyond their own worlds, like they've brought in their horizons in that way. Um, Amanda, what would you like to add to that? Um, personally, being um, a student of WAC, I like and having graduated already, I feel like I am definitely a lot more environmentally and socially conscious of the forces that affect me. And going into college, I think it's going to help me a lot. Um, any idea what you got, what um, kind of major or what you're interested in for the future? Um, well, right now I'm undeclared, but at UC Davis, I am in the College of and environmental science so I'm, I'm thinking of heading towards that direction but just not totally decided on like what specific major all right uh, thank you for being here Rochelle Amanda and Jody um, you can learn more about walk at walksf.net do you know how freedom sounds I said do you know how freedom sounds it sounds like spirits in the native trees. It sounds like thunder from the ground. And did you know that freedom looks like a river flowing free and strong, like how we found each other? And yes, together we will work, try hard to make life better the way that water carves through stone. But we can't do this alone. River Chico Redemption by Descarte Naman off their self-published Cultural Gorillas album from 2012. You're listening to Apex Express. APA Equality Northern California is a grassroots organization in San Francisco working towards building power for API lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities. Apink's work, uh, Apink is working on intersectional social justice issues, creating pipelines of support for social change makers. APINC's high school and college age youth play a central role in the organization and in leading this movement. We have with us in the studio, the director of APINC, Sammy Ableza Wills. Welcome, Sammy. Hi, y'all. Thanks for having me. Uh, Sammy, could you start us off by sharing the ways APINC is building power within the API LGBTQ community? What are the most pressing issues currently? 
Certainly. Um, so APINC, which once again stands for API Equality Northern California, uh, we work to build power for LGBTQ, Asian, and Pacific Islander people. Uh, and when we think about the LGBTQ, Asian, Pacific Islander community, we really think about what are people at that specific intersection facing? Right. So oftentimes people aren't able to have freedom or safety within their own homes or on the streets in their communities outside, outside their own families. So we work to build power within that community so that people can have safe access to things like housing, to things like health care, to resources that affirm their full humanity. Uh, we think about what's going on lately in the world with this administration. And there's so many pressing issues that uniquely face LGBTQ, Asian and Pacific Islander people. Right now, people across the entire nation are fighting for DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. People have been fighting a long time for health care. And at APINC, we see our role in the community and in the movement ecosystem as creating leaders who can respond to these pressing issues and more than respond, also build the alternatives for a new world, build the interdependent systems that give us the ability to live full and human lives that actually affirm every single part of who we are. Hmm. So what are the ways in which young people uh, participate and lead APINC? Well, our organization is really led by young people. Uh, although we're not advertised as a youth organization, our leadership, our staff, our core volunteers are all people younger than 26 um, or, you know, even younger than 26 in college and sometimes in high school. Uh, so as an organization, all of the things that we do are really informed by the lived experiences of the young people that come through our doors and the young people that lead our programs and projects. Uh, so oftentimes when we're doing organizational work, we're actually learning and growing together as we're doing it. When we're thinking about our strategic plan, we're asking our elders in our community, our, our fellow movement comrades to think about what, what have their strategies look like and how, how can we as young people build upon those and create things from our perspective and from our learned and lived experiences. So young people lead our fundraising efforts, our communications, and all of our different programs around oral history, trans justice, and leadership development. Um, young people are really core to every single thing that we do. Mm -hmm. So I know that this year, it was the first year you held pop camp uh, which I forget what it stands for, Pride Over People? People no. Over Pride. <laughs> oh, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be concerned if it was called the other thing. Me too, me too. Um, and uh, what led you to start this camp for high school-aged youth specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, our organization, um, while being youth-led, is also truly intergenerational. So uh, as young people, we acknowledge how important it is to learn from the people that come before us, learn from our elders and different people in movements, learn from people in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Um, and as we've done this work over the past few years, we've acknowledged that sometimes uh, young people aren't always comfortable talking to older folks. Uh, a lot of us have trauma around people that are the same age as our parents. We have trauma around older folks who have told us what to do, policed our bodies, our expressions, our genders. Um, so we decided how important it was to create a youth-centered space by and for young people. So we established Pop Camp people over pride as a way to return to our radical legacy as a LGBTQ people of color community. Um, you know, the first pride in Stonewall, uh, that first pride was a rebellion against police brutality. It was a rebellion against state violence. And as young people, we want to return to that legacy and always stay rooted in that analysis that these, these state these violent systems aren't going to save us and we have to build alternatives to those things. And, you know, especially after the election, I think there was a lot of fear, a lot of trauma, a lot of hurt for a lot of people. So after the election, we really came together and saw the urgency in creating a youth-centered space. We saw how across the nation, there were marches, there were walkouts, there were protests led by high school youth and college youth uh, on their campuses and off of their campuses. 
And so it became really important to think about how are we building for these four years and also beyond these four years and creating a space for young people to learn those, learn those skills and build that community. I might be dating myself, but when I was in high school, there was maybe one or two people who were out. Um, it wasn't, um, pe- you know, people didn't feel safe back then. It was a new thing to have great gay straight alliances. Um, so can you talk about how you did the outreach and also what the programming was for the camp? Like what were the, what were the activities? Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, the, the landscape for high school youth and young people has really changed in colleges. Uh, it seems like so many people are queer and so many people are out and that still doesn't diminish the problems that that people are feeling at home, um, the problems that they're feeling in their school, within their administrations. So when we were doing outreach, we were thinking really intentionally about where, you know, where are folks checking the most? They're on social media. They're looking at sites like Tumblr. Um, Are they always going to want to tell their parents that they're going to a queer camp? Probably not. So how are we making it accessible for people who are at various stages in their journey? Uh, We actually reached out to a lot of other movement organizations and social justice organizations that do youth work, but maybe don't focus on LGBTQ issues because in the past, there's a lot of organizations that have youth-centered work, um, but that aren't necessarily equipped for the changing identities and demographics of their youth themselves. And we're seeing more and more people come out every single year come out as trans, come out as gender nonconforming, come out as non-binary. And our movement spaces also need to be equipped with the tools and with the analysis to support those young people. So we reached out to different movement organizations, we utilized social media, and we had conversations as a group about how we could make this accessible to people who aren't out. Um, and so once they... And these were all um, Bay Area schools? Or uh, actually, Bay nationally. Area. Oh, really? Yeah. We, we recruited youth from across the entire nation to come. So there was youth from New York, from the Midwest, from Virginia, um, to California. People coming from all around because they had never been in a space like this before. Wow. And how many, how many people were involved? Uh, This year, we had 15 participants from around the nation and a facilitator team of five folks. That's great. And it was facilitated by college-age youth or your interns, is that correct? Yeah, so the the main facilitators, the main two facilitators were youth in the age range, the age range being 14 to 20. Um, And so all of the key facilitators, the people leading the majority of the workshops were people within that age range. And can you summarize, like, or give us a sampling of those workshops? Yeah, so Pop Camp lasted over three days, and we wanted to focus on a variety of issues, both concrete concrete tools and skills, and also life-affirming techniques and community-building techniques. So we taught, taught folks about things like direct action, but we also went into our politicized history. What did it mean to organize as LGBTQ, Asian Pacific Islander people in the 60s? What can we learn from that? to uh, workshops focusing on body image and self-care and preservation in the movement so that we can do this for the long haul. Hmm. Um, being in the queer API community myself, I see a lot of people who've gone through the internship and just what wonderful experience that they had. And I know that you have a popular summer internship for college-age youth um, that's been running for eight years now. So what does this internship focus on? Mm-hmm. Uh, This internship, you know, it really holds a special place in my heart. I actually started at the organization back in 2013 as a summer intern myself, um, as a college student kind of coming up. So the summer internship focuses similarly to Pop Camp on skills building, political education, um, and human transformation. So we think about the community organizing skills that people need to create change, you know, how to build a one-on-one relationship, how to create inclusive community spaces, how to do grassroots fundraising and outreach uh, to our own community histories. How are we connecting with our elders, with um, all the people who organized in Unbound Feet or GAPA or Chacon or Utopia throughout the decades to giving our interns a lot of autonomy over the work that they do. So each intern actually leads a personal project over the course of the summer 
that benefits the LGBTQ Asian Pacific Islander community. And this could be things ranging from creating an intergenerational community care network to developing a zine specifically for the LGBTQ Asian Pacific Islander community to working with one of our community partners to make sure that their work is continuously more intersectional and through a queer and trans lens. Hmm. So what's coming up for APINC in the future and how can other people support your work? Uh, APINC is constantly, constantly busy. Uh, as a small grassroots organization, uh, you know, we, we, we actually have two staff people. So our work is really powered by the volunteers that come through our door. Uh, and I think that gives a lot of room and capacity for people to contribute as they as they need, as they want. We always stay responsive to our community needs because that's what grounds us every single day. So in the coming months, there's a lot of ways to get involved from uh, disseminating stories from our Dragon Fruit Project, which is our intergenerational oral history project. That could be creating art, making graphics, working on communications, talking to media, to uh, participating in a training on community organizing, on outreach, to attending community events and building that that interdependence that centers all of us, or to participating in our fundraising campaigns to think critically as a community about how we ask for help, how we talk about money, and how we sustain ourselves for our full self-determination. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sammy, for coming through. Um, you could learn, Can you give us the website for more information? Yes, certainly. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you can visit us at apiequalitync.org or check out our Twitter, which is at APIENC. We're going to have a music break with Como Puedes Vivir Contigo Mismo, or How Can You Live With Yourself, by queer Chilean artist Alex Ann Wanter. The song celebrates queer pride with shout-outs to the film Paris is Burning. January 2016, the Healthy Calif- the California Healthy Youth Act went into effect, adding new language to sex education to address relationship abuse, sex trafficking, and consent. It also strengthened previous requirements that instruction and materials be appropriate for students of all sexual orientations and genders, and ensures that sexual health or sexual health education does not promote outdated gender norms. Act 4 CUSD, or Act 4 Cupertino Union School District, is a local grassroots group formed to influence sex education policy. In studio, we have Meda Asana, who joins us. She's a founding member of Act for You CUSD. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for having me. So to kick us off, can you describe um, where you went to school and what you mm-hmm. remember about sex ed? Yeah. So I grew up in Cupertino. I went to Lawson Middle School in its inaugurating year. So we were the first class. Um, And so that's where I first kind of got like the sex ed that they teach. Um, To be honest, I don't remember too much. I think it wasn't an immediate concern for me at that time. But what I do remember is the question box, because that would just be like like a cardboard box where everyone in the class had to put in like could put in a question and the teacher would answer them for the whole class. So it's anonymous. And, um, you know, I think they said, if you don't have a question, just like, don't put anything and you can just, but everyone had to put one. So I remember I always had questions um, that I wanted to know about, like my body, what, I, what was happening, all this stuff. And the questions I couldn't ask my parents, I could put in that box. So I do remember that. Mm. Yeah. And so with the California Healthy Youth Act, that went into effect in January. Um, so in January 2016. So can you go into more detail about what that law mandates? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 
basically it improved upon the comprehensive sex ed curriculum that we already have. So um, we do learn about sex, but we'd never learned about consent. So this was the first time that it put into effect like the difference between a healthy relationship and one that's abusive, one that's um, what classifies as assault, what is sex trafficking. Um, it also expands the definition of um, what is sexual intercourse beyond just vaginal, but also all these other types of sex that people do, but we're never taught about. Um, and then it is also LGBTQ affirming. So you learn about differing sexual orientations and genders. And that stuff is really critical, even for like 12 year olds and 13 year olds who are thinking about this stuff. Um, so yeah, it basically just broadens the definition and is helps all of us learn about our bodies and our relationships as we get older. Mm -hmm. So now can you talk about the controversy that um, erupted in Cupertino in terms of them updating their sex ed curriculum and, and where, um, can you summarize that and then talk about how, how you entered that dialogue? Yeah, so basically all the schools are in California have to now be in compliance with the California Healthy Youth Act. Um, but um, some sit, some school boards decide to have a vote on it. Um, and the Cupertino Uni Union School District, which is K through eight schools in Cupertino, was supposed to have a regular vote around updating middle school curriculum. Um, but there was this huge outpouring of parents and community members who came um, in large numbers first with a change.org petition saying that they were rejecting the curriculum that's compliant. They said that it was culturally insensitive. They said it was too graphic. They said it was age inappropriate. Um, so they wrote a petition and then they also showed up to the school board meeting, 150 people coming out with signs that say things like, let children be children. And these very kind of like shocking kind of language around inclusive, comprehensive sex ed. So because of all that pressure, the school board members ended up not approving the curriculum and it was stalled with a two to two vote and one person recusing themselves. So what that meant was that Cupertino, like CUSD, then failed to approve a compliant curriculum. And CUSD is already super out of compliance. Last time it was revised was 2004. So we have some major problems that we want to work on. Um, so when that whole controversy happened. Uh, a bunch of Cupertino alumni came together, myself, um, some other community organizers in the South Bay, um, East Asian, South Asian API folks came together and we were like, you know what, we should do something about this. This is happening in our own backyard. Like um, most of us are used to doing work in SF, but there's kind of the silence around the South Bay. Um, we come from like, you know, a majority API population where it, politics aren't as visible. So we wanted to do something and most of all represent kind of the alumni voice. A lot of the argument was about parents fighting over each other, saying what their kids want and need, but we weren't really hearing from the kids. In fact, in that, you know, groundbreaking meeting, a few high schoolers did try to talk, but they were booed by the parents. They were booed off the mic, mm. which is, it's so, it's like, you say that you're standing up for your kids, but you're not letting them talk. So it's it's very shocking. Um, so, yeah. what sort of uh, organized ways are the youth trying to speak out for themselves? Well, from what we know, after the you know that one that meeting, um, we didn't see any youth coming to speak at any of the three consecutive meetings that we were at. So we were founded right after that big meeting, and we came to the rest of the. Um, school board meetings to present public comments and we didn't see any youth so that's we realized that like we are kind of the closest thing to people who can take that that or are willing to be there at this moment um so what we ended up doing was writing a alumni letter so we kind of presented our voice like as um young people who came out of the school system, we can tell you that we did need this. The majority of us, of us are queer and trans API. Um, and we're talking about how um, we reject this language that it's culturally insensitive. Um, you know, we're POC, we're people of color. And that doesn't, we still need sex ed curriculum. We still want to know about our bodies. Um, so we came together with this alumni letter in under 24 hours, it was signed by over 300 alumni saying, yes, we want this. We, we want the school board to now approve 
a compliant curriculum since they rejected the first one. Um, so since then, we've been at the board meetings. We've been telling them that you need to be transparent. We're going to hold you accountable and you need to be compliant. So that's been our role. Can you, just to follow up on Eunice's question, can you talk mm-hmm. about how you've plugged in with people in the high schools? Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, this is was K through addressing K through eight. And so yeah. these youth graduate on to high school. Can, mm-hmm. So can you talk about how you've been connecting with them? Yeah. So a bunch of our organizers are actually... Um, in touch with like the GSAs at high school. So that's the um, formerly Gay Straight Alliance. Now a lot of them have switched to Gender and Sexualities Alliance. Um, So, you know, some of those organizers were presidents and VPs of those clubs when we were, you know, when we were 14. Um, So now um, we've done a little bit of outreach, but now we're kind of in this moment after the storm, which was just highly like rapid response to whatever was going on in the meetings. And now we're really trying to get our bearings and connecting more with these clubs, seeing what the high schools are doing because middle schools aren't, um, I don't think, in the place to be mobilized in this way about sex ed because they're still pretty young. Um, so yeah, we, we have uh, a lot of parents and teachers on board and then they're connected with also some student groups as we are. So it's all, now we're kind of going like a deep dive into all of it now that the drama of May and June is over. And can you address some of the um, the issues that were raised about um, the, the legally mandated curriculum being culturally insensitive? Like, mm-hmm. you know, um, when we're talking about this population, we are actually talking about Asian American parents who were opposed to mm-hmm. the curriculum. Um, and so what is your understanding about their stance and how did you counteract it? Yeah, it's it's complicated, you know, because it's true that the majority of the parents that were speaking out are immigrant API families. And I think what it comes down to is that they're just preaching what they know, which is that they never really had sex ed growing up in their schools. Like we literally hear stories about these parents, for example, like growing up in India, like um, my parents or uh, in those generations. Um, And they said that when it came to that chapter in the book around sex ed, the teacher was very embarrassed and was like, you should read this chapter on your own. So it was like, don't talk about it type of thing. There's so much stigma around it. So um, I think there's a lot of like resistance to wanting this, um, information being taught to their kids but that doesn't mean that like I said before that we don't need it or that we don't uh, want it especially as kids Um, I think it's more of a reason than ever that we all need to have this information and to be as part of like a like a collective like understanding parents teachers students like community members like we should be in this together working through the material and some of those next steps involve like having info sessions we want to create like maybe heart-to-heart conversations where we can have those long like long-term conversations about hey like I do want to learn about my body I do want to learn about this stuff even if you think I'm not doing it or like even if you think that we I don't I shouldn't know about it it is important to me. I think one of the important things that you were sharing with us before we got on the air was the role that a hate group plays in backing the Mm -hmm. um, parents' resistance to the curriculum. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So there's a lot of factors in this process, um, in this kind of issue, situation to specific to Cupertino. But um, one of those is that there was this presence of a hate group, anti-LGBTQ group called the Pacific Justice Institute. And um, they actually have put time and resources into these cases um, happening across the South Bay where they're emboldening parents. They're kind of helping organize parents to come out in large numbers and um, resist and like denounce um, the curriculum. So we're seeing it across not just Cupertino, but San Jose, Palo Alto, Los Gatos. Um, And we've been connecting with different groups um, like Health Connected, which published the curriculum, ACLU, and talking through these, what's going on here? And PJI is one of those common factors, which is everywhere. So it's really kind of insidious and scary that our parents um, who really care about us and want to know are being 
like manipulated, you know, by a group. So in the Cupertino case, there are a few other factors. Parents are saying that the procedure um, of a, the adoption was too rushed and there wasn't enough parent, parental input. So there are some legitimate concerns, but um, yeah, there's... It's scary. I think the other thing is just that Sammy from A Pink was saying that that group was also involved in supporting the Chinese Americans, who, um, Christians who were opposed to gay marriage. Yeah. So that was like five thousand of them th yeah. that they organized to come out. That's well, cool. thank you, Meda Asano with Act for CUSD. Um, can you tell us how folks can engage with your campaign? Sure. Um, so. If you would like to get involved, please email us at actforcusd at gmail.com. Also, check out your local school board and how they're, if they're compliant or not. That's super helpful and necessary. Great. And um, thank you to Claudia Lung for giving us a tip on that story. And now we're with the community calendar. On Labor Day, there's a strike and march in Oakland in support of organized labor. Uh, fast food workers in 300 cities and in the UK are going to be on strike to demand a livable wage. In Oakland, meet at 1330 Jackson Street Monday morning. On Tuesday, the Parkway Theater screens and then they came for us. The documentary features actor and activist George Takei and many other Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. This screening includes a post-show discussion. For more information on the community calendar or to subscribe to our podcast, hit up our website, apexexpress.org. Apex Express <clears throat> is produced by Marie Che, DJ Bagi, Salima Hamarani, Miko Lee, Ayame Keen Lee, Preeti Mangala Shekar, Robin Takayama, and Michael Yoshida. Thanks to Lindsay Oda for help on tonight's show. With Mike Biggs at the board, we've been your hosts, Nono Girl. And I'm Eunice Kwan. <laughs>